Hello, I'm Chris Blask. I'm the Vice President of Strategy with Cybeats. Uh, this is the Powerhouse uh, Cybeats Powerhouse Perspectives, episode number 30. So thanks for joining us. And thanks, Phil Tonkin, for joining us as well. How are you doing? Hey, very good. Thank you. Good. And where in the world are you today? I'm in Warwickshire in the UK. And, and, and you have a lovely backyard as well. Thank you. So, <laughs> As we're, as we're discussing in the in the green room before this, you know, you know, we look in these conversations to look back, look at the, at the present, look at the, into the future from the perspective of folks like you, you know, who've been there, seen it, done it. And we typically don't you know, go into great depth on bios and backgrounds and so forth. People can look look each other up on uh, on LinkedIn. Um, but you spend a lot of time an asset owner in the grid, you know, running electrical systems and so forth. And that's yeah. Now, you know, as according to your shirt there, you're with a vendor now, a uh, uh, Dragos. And we're always, you know, the main thread we're trying to explore in these conversations is transparency. Um, you know, shout out to, to Tom Allrich and uh, and team that uh, just came out the SBOM forum meeting that Tom has instigated. And I think we've actually moved forward the uh, software component naming issue, you know, which is a sort of interesting topic by itself that I could uh, squirrel off into in this. But you know, to try to queue up the, the first question, you know, looking back, Right. As, as a grid operator, you know, given that I'm sure you've heard all the same things that, that I've always heard, you know, working with folks like you on the on the asset owner side you know, over the last couple of decades is, oh, surely we must all surely we know. Surely we, we already know what's in the grid and where it is. And surely we've gotten to that point. And we haven't, you know, particularly looking back, you know, 10 and 20 years. So, yeah, yeah as usual, you know, as I try to instigate in these conversations, take it anywhere you want. You know, but looking back, how much did we know? And if Anthony, if you can roll that, yeah, you know, how well think, did we know our grids when you first saw them? Yeah, I think the um, the key thing to think about is that asset owners knew what they needed to know, you know, based on on what it was what was required to mass manage the assets that they had, uh, and it's pretty tricky to um, you know to to gather just the right amount of information to make the right decisions in a changing landscape. If you were to look back twenty years. The, an asset owner was managing a, a fiscal asset as well as a physical engineering asset. They needed to know what was required to maintain it. They needed to know when it was the right time to replace it, how it was performing in, in defect conditions. So they gathered just the right amount of information to do that. And sometimes that meant just having a single record for a combined system because the system, it performs and does a, you know does a function at a system level you didn't necessarily need to know all of the components but as asset management techniques refined there was a there's always been a requirement to grow a better understanding of components so when you think about something like a power transformer that is a single very large asset and often that would be the only thing you knew you had a transformer and it would have a unique identifier Later, it became. I need to know what the bushings are. When were those bushings manufactured? You know, what you know the type of cooling that's on it. You know, what type of tap changer was on it? It and then the granularity of data around those things as the systems associated with it became more sophisticated, have, grew, have led to a need for much more detailed information about the uh, you know the the digital components that were connected to it. And now we're dealing with different types of asset management issues you know we one of the big things about managing assets is you need to manage the risks associated with them risks aren't always uh they've always been there you know the, the, they've been there are risks from bad weather risks of failure re, you know risks of sabotage we've now got this new threat that faces these assets because they're digitized you know they they so you've got cybersecurity issues that need to be addressed, which means you need to understand those assets at a new and different level. And for a good time, in certain areas, we've we've strived to make sure we understand what version of firmware is installed on it. You know, and you know, is there a known defect against that and is it being updated and is there a plan mitigation around it? We've you know organizations have tried to gain greater and greater visibility to the connectivity of those assets and we've been on a journey for the last 10 years to try and improve that that overall asset visibility but what's clear now is you know with the increased supply chain risks that have, have manifested with the complexity in the way that vendors are developing their products that there's another level of detail that we need to get to 
you know, we need to get beyond just knowing that this vendor has this version of firmware, but we need to understand how have they gone about making that, and what commercial risks and what cyber risks are you exposed to by by just accepting that product as as known and trusted. So I think it's, um, I would say, well, what did we know about the grid before? You know, we, we've always known the right amount of information. Making a shift takes time, and there's a and there's a there's a journey to get there. And I think we're on that journey. And so it's, but it, but it's, uh, it's something that we're gonna have to work really hard on, you know, to try and get to the point where we we know everything that's already out there, and we've got good processes and controls to make sure we understand what's coming. I can try to tie a couple of things together here because right at the beginning of there, you said you said something very important, and this is what I've always liked about operational technology. You knew enough, you know, we knew enough. Right. And before I got in cybersecurity, you know, I, uh, at General Electric in 1990, um, I ran the plant full network. That's how I got my OT exposure. But we also installed a video conference center and I connected the two of them and ended up doing all the video stuff. And at that same time, you may have uh, may remember this earlier in your career, uh, the, the 9000F turbine, the biggest engine in the world, a 300,000 horsepower turbine. Um, and we came out with it during, you know, we built the prototype at the plant I worked at, ended up taking some out all the video stuff. I did a documentary on it, a walkthrough step by step by step, all the machine operators and the and the engineers that built this thing. And just thinking about what you, what you said just now, uh, you're right. They knew exactly enough. They knew, you know, down to the, the bearing, the temperatures and how you get that information and so forth, right before the, the real cyber era in, in ICS. And yeah, as as I mentioned, my first deal op opening volley here, you know, if, you know, tidbits. Then you know, let everybody know this is how current we are. This is now. You know, today. You know, I learned from Steve Springett. You know, who's been leading the Cyclone DX uh, uh, um, uh, S bomb format uh, efforts and so forth. In this meeting that I talked about just before this one, that even though we're just starting here, there have been 272 million um, objects of code represented in Cyclone DX so far. You know, at, you know, as much as, you know, the people watching can can tell, which is a subset of whatever the total is. And that that path, you know, from 1990 with me, from your your whole career uh, working in the grid. You know, the, you know, this clash, let's see if I can lead up to this, this, you know, where we are now question, right? Again, always liked OT because they know how to get enough information. What is the information you have to have? You know, how do you get that? You get it. You make sure you get it and you do. Whereas with cyber, you know, for all our, our advantages, we've always been like, I don't know, let's try it, you know, blah, 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 you know, throw it in the air, figure it out, you know, move forward, less engineering, more, more art. So we're at this point right now. So Anthony, if you can roll that next one, we can see a lot for people who are really following cybersecurity. It looks like threat intelligence is pretty well developed. It looks like information sharing is pretty well developed. It looks like, you know, with, with your vendor and my vendor, you know, that visibility into operations on OT networks and into supply chains is you know, really good now. What are we missing? You know, what do you think we're not seeing? You know that we're going to be over the next couple of years, perhaps. You know, realize that we yeah. need to add to that mix. I think the um, it's an exciting time because we have we're at a we were at one of those crossing points where we know what we need and we've identified that new requirement. For, and so we're hearing uh, we've heard a lot. You know. The asset, the network identification space, the you know threat threat, threat monitoring, that's a well-established industry, and you know, players have moved along and, and developed, and that's that's become a, a core requirement of most people's OT strategies. And we're hearing now where people are talking about things like S bomb, and they're saying we need it, you know, and that's that's that exciting time where everyone acknowledges that this is no longer something that is. Um, a want or you know or, or a niche requirement it's something that is required but we're at the beginning of that in terms of people's actual understanding of it what does it you know, does a does an asset owner really need to have the s bomb for the equipment they've got or they just do they just need to know it exists do they need to know that it is held in a, in a trusted way that the information that they need to know about the assets is available so there are there are lots of questions to be asked still yeah, about right. what both vendors and or OEMs and you know and the asset operators you know how do they use these things in order to get real insights because there's data and there's information and 
S bomb, you know, is is great. It's a solidified term that everybody's got behind. We're seeing you know great interest in it. I'm really excited to see you know what Dale's added at S four around around S bomb, you know, because I think it's a it's a real indication that the industry has matured to the point where you know it's ready to launch and you know. They're, but there are all those great products out there that are going to um, you know, really move this forward and your know, movement from government, asset owners and, and vendors all behind getting it getting it working. There's a lot of agreement still needs to be made. And I think that's what that makes it an exciting time right now. It is going to take still many years to get to the point where it is a, a mature capability that everybody's actively using and understands how to use, you know, that we can have a an open yet still competitive landscape around around the you know the capabilities that people provide that but everybody is comfortable to share the right level of information so that we you know that the people who actually own and operate the assets, the people who really own the risk have got everything that they need to, you know, to, to manage their exposed vulnerabilities. Yeah, you know, I think that's that's going to be a, a big shift. It'll change. It'll require ultimately a shift in regulation. That takes a long time, but you know, we've got to, You know, if we take uh, operators of assets uh, in the in the NERCSIP environment, you know, there's they have obligations to patch vulnerabilities, but. At the moment, their vulnerabilities are the ones that are listed in the National Vulnerability Database. And you can have one product where there's a disclosed vulnerability and another that doesn't, but they are still exposed to those vulnerabilities. Some owners will will know more because they are, you know, they've got an S bomb or they've got access to, you know, to, to VEX files driven by by S bombs, which are telling them that they've got more to deal with. How is it fair that one has to patch and the other one doesn't? You start to you know you start to create a non-competitive environment. So I think it's going to take quite a while for regulation to catch up, and for everybody to understand exactly what they've got to do, um, you know, with this information. But most importantly, it's about people being able to manage to actively manage their risks, and I think that's the most important thing. It's not about compliance; it is about being able to manage your risks. And any business that wants to be resilient in a in a an environment where you know the stability and resilience and cost of running things like energy networks, but but everything in your in the uh, operational space is is fragile. You know you're, whether it's the efficient production of pharmaceuticals, you know, having just come out of a you know a, of a, a pandemic. You know whether it's you know getting food to people in a in a in a cost effective and safe manner when there's a world worldwide crisis on you on the supply of food because of you know the war in ukraine there's so many things that you know that make our current physical supply chains fragile and all of those physical supply chains are driven by digital technology now and therefore we want all asset owners and operators of all types not just the grid you know we are. There's never been a movie where somebody with hacking in where somebody hasn't tried to switch off the lights. You know, that's it's great that uh, you know that idea of um, of the you know, the grid being something that needs to be protected is is out there and in people's minds in Hollywood. But um, it, the the reality is that operational technology networks in so many different verticals need to be protected and. We need this. We need the regulations to apply to many other industries to try and drive the you know, maturity in some of those spaces. We need people to understand and manage their risks and keep uh, keep moving the needle to make sure that the the, the wrong the, the people who shouldn't be in these networks can't get in because the right proportional actions are taken to manage the risks that these asset owners are, exp are exposed to. You know, you you sparked a number of interesting. Trains of at least interesting to me. Trains of thought in my head at the moment. And I, I think, yeah, that's again. It's this is where we are right now. You know, and you talked about. You know, I'm going to try to tie perhaps three things together. You know, that one, the fact that you know folks like me are still trying to figure out how to communicate this, right? And what you said about OT, yeah, you know, reminds me of uh, as I mentioned, you know, in General Electric in South Carolina in uh, in 1990. You know, all these little inter all these interviews I'm doing. The one guy that sticks out in my head, you know, is a, you know, 60 something uh, machine operator making the buckets, you know, that take the fuel air mixture and put it into the turbine, you know, create the flaming torus of, of, you know, plasma inside this monstrous machine and so forth. And as a, I, I thought about this guy a lot over the years, you know, this is a guy I've been at it his entire career, you know, his entire life building these things that barely contain, you know, molten, you know, craziness, you know, to give us power and so forth. And 1990 was modern at the time. He's talking about the ceramic coating and the dry low knock system 
you know, on the buckets, you know, and how that, you know, contains micro turbulence and so on and so forth. And, and your, your first comment, you know, we knew enough. And this is at that point in this arc, you know, of, of, of harnessing, you know, flame to make uh, electricity. This guy knew exactly what he needed to know. Right. And I, and I can't pull up some of the questions I had for him during that. And I think the, the video still exists, but you know, I was, you know, I was interested because he was driving into how much we, you know, with com computer modeling 1990, they could actually look at it. That's why the dry low knocks and the ceramic coatings and he was all excited about, it was a new evolution for him. And those motors went on to, you know, rule, dominate the global market for, for decades and got up to 600,000 horsepower with the same format. And the, the, and you touch on the NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, right? You know, again, as recently as an hour ago, right? This is something that a group of, you know, folks who are focusing on this as hard as anything else that have been, you know, instigating a lot of the, the SBOM world run right now, are just now working through. And, you know, the National Vulnerability Database, you know, for those who don't know, is, is the world's largest, you know, compendium of vulnerabilities. It's run by MITRE now, um, but it's complicated. It's reached the point where its additional purpose, we need a centralized repository, makes sense, you know, whenever that was started, you know, quite some time ago, has gone to the point that how do you do that? You know, with 272 million Cyclone DX, you know, instances of and cloud native and AI generated and, and, and. And, you know, the, the conclusion we're all coming up to, I, I think, is you don't, right? You can't. Um, from the sounds of it, MITRE and NIST, you know, are struggling with the, the workload of even doing that. You know, conceptually, you take that old school way of doing thing and push it into the future, and it obviously doesn't work. How do you change that? Don't know. But it looks like we've got some agreement on how we can move forward in the, in the next step of all that. Which, Anthony, if you will go for the last question, um, Leads me to this pondering, right? You know, my my obsession with inevitability curves, right? The inevitability of creating the NVD. You know, I can't, I think it was in the 90s. I remember the, the conversation around that, right? You know, it was inevitable we had to do something, but it's also inevitable that it can't last forever. Can't scale that infinitely. It's inevitable that we have to have that kind of visibility in the world, you know, to tie these, my rant together, where the operators have the information they need and not more. You know, and it's just a very current conversation to say, how do I actually get, you know, that operator, the information, the trust in the attestation that they can have that information if they need based on policy, you know, and, and yeah, the, 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 you know, my thoughts are that, you know, keep coming back to your first statement. And I keep saying this to people. It's like, in you know, people have been doing this forever you know, with explosive plasma torus flaming steam pressure stuff. And we have enough information to do that in the real world and either run it or build it and give it to somebody else to run and not kill them. And inside of lessons on how we don't have too much information, how we get enough down to. So, you know, I, I would think, you know, I'll go on a limb. I think in the next decade or two, we kind of reach the point where, we're, where we, we can do the same sort of things. With you know, not everything. You can't know everything. But maybe you know enough. I think it's so, just inevitable yeah. that the uh, enough the word you know, the word enough is it it change it, the what in what enough is changes. Yeah. I think you know, you know, where you know, and that that what we what is enough today is has moved on and we now need to know at a, at a granular level what goes into making up firmware or, or the um, the collection of software that's packaged up in order to make the systems that that make everything that we have become reliant on in society work. Um, and further down the line, we'll need to know even more information about it. We'll need to know not just how is it made up, but who made it, and how was it manipulated, and how did it change. You know, uh, and I, I reflect on on my own um, sort of you know, experience and learning over the last four or five years in this topic, where you know, which went from a, a, a conversation where I'd invented a term called cyber genealogy. You know, I was interested in the family history of assets and how they evolved. I hadn't heard of the term S bomb, and I had a great conversation with uh, with Eric Byers, and you know, we we came, we realized we were on you know on on the same wavelength about solving a problem. And then you know, later, our conversations about digital bills and materials and, and it be meaning more than just the software, but the physical components that make things and how they've been handled. I think that it is, it, there is the, the, what's inevitable for me is that, is that 
SBOM, as we understand it, the makeup of software will become the norm. And then the, the and what is well the and the end of that curve will be the beginning of a new one, which is we then okay we now need to know who's touched this through its life and how is it being handled and how has it changed so that we can only, again know more about how we're exposed to risks. And I think that's the well, you know that's that's the change for me. I, I I'm stealing cyber genealogy. Uh, uh you know it, it, I'll share this. My, my uh, father-in-law uh, passed away. Uh, this past week, 96 years old, born two months uh, away from uh, um, Queen Elizabeth. So it's been a, a heck of a week in this. But you know, I, I say that because the genealogy, you think about these different cases. You know, Tom White was an amazing man, you know, depression era child, oldest, oldest uh, uh, kid, World War II vet, you know, you know and, you know, deserves the, the, the respect and reflection and, and understanding, you know, we all, we all have for him right now. And Queen Elizabeth is Queen Elizabeth. You know, our understanding of Queen Elizabeth and her genealogy is at a different level because, you know, this it has to be. And it's not because mm -hmm. one of these people is better than the other. It's because pragmatically, this is this is if you're going to attach royalty and literal power and authority and so forth. You know, you know as any anybody knows who follows, you know, the British royal family or any royal families, all the information you can possibly imagine is out there because it's been tracked to that level. And. And again, I think yeah, I think you've given us a lot to you know, a lot to take from this. At least I have that picture of that. I'm picturing now that bucket uh, uh, manufacturer at General Electric, you know, knows as much as he needs. And sometimes in this cyber stuff, you know, in the world you've lived in, when you're running certain assets like nuclear reactors and so forth, how much you need to know about that genealogy is a heck of a lot. And sometimes it is just not right. And that's. The way we've been doing that in the, in the past probably tells us a lot about how we're going to be doing that in the future as well. Yeah, so. I agree entirely. I think it's um, we we need to have a we need to have a better understanding. It's it's different from what we needed in the past. It's not because anybody's done anything wrong, um, but we know we need to change, and we and sometimes that means looking back at what we already had and trying to understand that better, as well as thinking about how we get things right in the future. Indeed. Well, with that. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to you. Thank you for anybody who's out there watching us and uh, helping me. move this ball forward. So, Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on, folks. See you next time.